Alrighty. Um, so here we have the question kind of like what extension mechanisms are successful? How do we do that? Um, I believe uh, Martin Thompson, you're on the call. One of the questions I had is, you know, there's this document that was started by that you were working on um, as part of the IAB on kind of the analyzing this, how do we do protocol extension mechanisms? And there's a set of kind of recommendations here in design principles. And I think this is a really good set to start with. Um, and in general, I think this document is a really useful thing. Um, so I'd love to hear also from you um, kind of what we think we can do with this document. What are the things that maybe we could add to it or anything that's changed in the year um, since this has been updated? What has changed in the year since it's been updated? Probably not a lot. Um, <laughs> the, uh, well, in terms of the document, at least. The, um, the list that I have there is complete as I was aware of at the time, but um, since then I've thought more about the um, the involvement of extra parties in, in protocols and the, the effect that has on ossification. I've written something else on that subject that might be interesting as well. Um, okay. Yeah. What I would, Which was that? What was... Oh, I will put a, put a link to that in a second. Um, but I guess the main thing that this lacks is um, review and feedback from people and understanding what what it is that needs to happen in order to complete the set, as it were. Yep, yep, that makes sense. Um, so I guess, would you be amenable to kind of us uh, adopting just to kind of get it discussed and moving forward within this list and set of people? Yeah, I mean, obviously, any any document that's submitted this way, I, I kind of feel like if someone wants to contribute, then that's great. Um, I'm kind of at the end of what I can contribute. So mm -hmm. if if others want to pitch in, then we can probably turn it into something reasonable. That sounds good. One of the things um, I, I know it's just like in here for active use. You know, we we talk about that um, what is not discussed, and I'm not sure if it's appropriate for this document or for something else, is how do we kind of how do we actually make active use happen in the way that we design our extension mechanisms? Um, because I, I've seen you know different ways of how you set up your IANA considerations for your particular code points that make it hard to do active use or make it easy to do active use. Um, is that something that we could discuss more in here? Yeah, one of the things I've seen, and it, this may be just my own perceptions, is that there's there's a lot of protocols out there that have mechanisms that people care about, and they care about them for a variety of different reasons, but they 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 care about that mechanism, and that's the mechanism that continues to work under yes. a variety of con constraints and conditions. And so, um, one of the uh, intuitions that was part of Adam Langley's original greasing uh, document was um, very few extension points, um, and that's not something that I think people have really taken to heart. If you if you look at the way that you can extend different protocols as often every single possible option under the sun is yeah. is presented and that means that then you have five or six different IANA registries with different trade-offs with different mechanisms you choose this one if you want to do this and you choose this one if you want to do that and that hasn't I don't think worked out that well in, it, in the past exactly exactly um and 
Yeah, I, I've noticed much the same thing that, you know, we have lots of extension points. Sometimes I think people add them because especially like, let's say you have like a flags field and some fixed length thing. You don't want to take up the whole thing. You don't need to take up the whole thing for your initial version. And so you have points that you don't even know how you're going to use and they're hard to extend. Um, but other times it, it just seems like over over design and we have too many degrees of freedom and I, I think you know it'd be useful to have something to say that you know you should either have something that's active use or kind of make it an invariant and there is you shouldn't have a lot of room in between um, well so how do you like the the I see section four two and four three here is like how you simulate active use. How do you create an invariant without actively using it? Right, like so. An invariant yeah, is essentially yeah. a specification level contract with future developers of implementations of the protocol, or you know, implementations of part of the protocol in in the in the sense of intermediaries or so. And like one of the. Um, one of the things I really like about this document is that, you know, it's active use is point four point one, right? It's um, if you if you want to have an extension mechanism that works, you should have an extension mechanism that works. It's almost a truism, but mm -hmm. it's one that like at least in in um, uh, sort of earlier protocol design has been, you know, a, a matter of faith that you create an extension point and then it's an extension point. And and really the rest of the points here are about if you can't get active use for whatever reason, then you should simulate it. Yeah. Right. And like, so greasing is one way of simulating it and cryptography is a way of simulating it even harder. Uh, and invariance is just basically, you're, you're documenting your threat to simulate it. Yes. Right. I, I tend to think of uh, the cryptography one as, as uh, narrowing who you're exposed to um, more than uh, the the sort of randomization stuff that we're talking about in okay. other contexts, but um, right, it can it be used because yeah, you can still ossify on the point on the other side of the encryption. Right. It just right. reduces the set of people who can cause the problem for you. Right. And if you do it wrong, you can ossify on the encryption. <laughs> um, I'm pretty sure we've done that already. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I guess to the larger group, kind of in, in this context, um, I'd ask if anyone else kind of has examples that they'd like to bring up of kind of within their working groups, within the protocols that they've worked on. Um, what extension mechanisms do you have that work like, and does that, does it seem to ring true with, you know, it is the active use that works well. Uh, what are the properties of how you actually deal with those extension points? Um, and what are examples of things that um, were designed to be accessible, but then ended up not being? I, what, so? I'd like to add one but, question there to that, if I could, Tommy. Um, I'd like to hear of any examples of active use failing. That, that's true, yes. Yes, because we're making an assumption in this document that, you know, active use won't and like, it seems true on its on its face, but. Right, or, or essentially, like, is there color we can add to the active use to say, like, it's active use, but you have to do it in X way, not Y way. Um, all right, so Watson. So I, I'm going to tell you the sad story of the NTP V4 extension fields. Yeah. So, NTP v4 was designed with ex an extension field mechanism that only got published as an RFC about a decade later. And the implementation had been using them. It squatted the code points from the AA in a registry. And what also happened in that time is there were a number of problems with DDoS amplification. So UDP-based protocol, and because of all the amplification, people aggressively police NTP packets. So even though the extension fields are sometimes used, 
Now we're deploying something that actually is going to really use them at scale, and we're finding all sorts of network problems. Um, th this is just terrible. <laughs> it, it, it's really, really awful. And on top of that, we kept the format of the header the same for three versions. So there are devices out there that will send a packet with a single set bit and expect an NTP response. And as far as we can tell, they're perfectly happy to not understand any of it and just grab the grab parts of the response. So when we come out with version five, this is going to be a real challenge to get it ready to properly negotiate versions, et cetera. It's just terrible. Um, so thank you for sharing that. It was very, uh, that's a uplifting story for the morning. <laughs> um, do you, I mean, so it sounds like, I mean, that's a case in which, you know, it was not even really explicitly designed and not documented well until much later. Um, it's, how, how, do you see it kind of fitting into like, what, how would you describe its, uh, downfall succinctly? Um, I, I, so I wasn't, I wasn't there for the, for the creation of it and documentation. My understanding is that it had been implemented in a widely deployed implementation, but the protocol that used that extension hadn't been, wasn't very widely deployed for a very good reason. And then when it came time to actually start using it, all sorts of issues started popping up. So that the, the primary use of the protocol um, for a long time didn't have any use of this extension mechanism, essentially. That's correct. Yeah. And then all of a sudden it said, hey, we have this mechanism, let's try to use it. And then you just realize that, well, that never would have worked. Yeah. No, it's going to work somewhat. Uh, yeah. It's just very problematic, very temperamental, depends on your ISP, and hopefully... Yeah, when... yeah. Uh, which essentially makes it... Even if you break only 5% of the places, that makes something not really practical for most. No, it, it, it's better than that. There's like a range of lengths that's bad. So if you get bigger than that length, then it works. And then four packets go by and it doesn't work. And then it starts working again. And so you go through the cycle. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you for sharing. Um, I think uh, Chris is next in the queue. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Uh, so, <laughs> so, hold on. There we go. Yeah, go for it. Okay. Uh, good. Yep. Okay. Um, yeah. So you were asking about uh, failures, um, and obviously TLS has these extensions, and they've had mixed success. Um, in terms of actually working in practice, sometimes new extensions do work, sometimes they don't, um, and sometimes they fail miserably for a variety of reasons, um, like um, ESNI's recent uh, debacle being blocked maliciously by China. I don't know if you would classify that as an extension, like a failure of the extensibility mechanism to not like hide itself from that particular <laughs> adversary or not. Um, so I, I guess I, it's not clear to me when you when you're asking about failures or successes rather um, what is the like the threat model that we're concerned with is it just like this dumb anti ossifying middle box that could potentially be buggy or is it something more malicious that's actively trying to you know prevent the use of certain extensions or just a general extension mechanism? I think that's a good. Um, distinction to bring up and maybe something that we would want to, you know, doc document at least that, I mean, that, that gets to the point of, you know, do you, what do you put behind that cryptography barrier to reduce the number of people who can do this? Because even if you have active use, but people don't like what you're using, they can, I mean, that's not really an ossification, that's an attack. We'll get the yeah, but the end result is effectively the same, right? Like, you yes. failed to use this new ex extension. So, yeah, I don't know if making that distinction is useful or not. It might be um, in terms of, like, guiding which extension mechanism to use. Um, so. 
Tearless is kind of unique in the sense that it provides the encryption that doesn't necessarily encrypt itself. And so it has this sort of bootstrapping problem that the encrypted client alone is, is the perfect example of, right? You don't have a prior session, so therefore you don't have crypto keys. And yep. so you end up in this in this situation where you are, have to be exposed to all of these these third parties. When you say that, um, are you distinguishing TLS from Quick? I wasn't going to get into that. I think Quick has different characteristics, but I suspect that Quick ends up being much like TLS in in this regard as well. Okay, yeah, I wasn't sure if you were. Um, if your point was that. In TLS or TCP, everything's literally in plain text, whereas in like quick, the initials are, you know, obfuscated. They're scrambled. Yeah, yeah. like the keys are not. Um, I'm not sure how effective that that measure will be in the long run, but we'll yeah. we'll find out. I, I agree. <laughs> well, well, I think it it probably only helps to the extent that a middle box is just a dumb ossifying middle box as opposed to one that's actually intentionally trying to do something with this, but we're, I mean, we're probably going to see things beyond active attackers that will say, oh, I will help you by looking at your quick initial and trying to inspect it. So, yeah. Yeah. That's it for me. All right. Thank you. Um, Brian. So the, the TLS point is interesting because and and I, I think I'm going to be annoying transport guy and say we need to treat security okay. special here um, because one there's the physics problem right like so no matter how we how we um, wave our hands around the problem of you can't have um, uh, cryptographic context before you've shared cryptographic context right like so that's just that's a hard physical problem yep. that unless we you know won't get into that. Um, the other issue with TLS that it, I think it popped up when, when Chris pointed out the, the SNI interception is that there's different models of non-functioning of an extension uh, mechanism that we need to talk about, right? Like, so the SNI non-functioning of that extension mechanism fundamentally changes the security properties of the channel. And that now you know who one of the endpoints is that you weren't supposed to know. Um, whereas, you know, non-functioning of, uh, you know, sort of, I'll say, pre-hipster protocol um, extension mechanisms was, okay, if I speak this extension mechanism and you speak, or if I, if I speak this extension and you speak it, then we will negotiate it and we'll, we'll upgrade. Um, there's something fundamental hiding in the fact that in certain cases, upgrade is sort of this optional nice to have and in other cases it fundamentally changes the 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 um properties of the channel in an unacceptable way right like so that the 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 use of the words upgrade and downgrade when you talk about downgrade and then the word attack usually comes after that in a tls context um i'm wondering if there's something in the physics of these protocols that makes it necessary to treat these cases separately right like so we can talk about you know SNI is an extension mechanism, or we could talk about um, SAC as an extension mechanism. Are they like, we think of them as extension mechanisms because it's different bits on the wire, but is there something fundamental about the semantics of these things that means that we should actually use different terminology for the two different things? And this is not me saying, oh, the security thing is hard and I'd rather not think about it. It's the the fact that in some cases, the the like the consequences of the failure of an extension mechanism can be wide, widely um, different. When and, and in some cases, the failure of an extension mechanism can be it, it can be preferable to have a failure, complete failure of connectivity than the failure of the extension mechanism. Right. Like so, in the SNI case, mm -hmm. where you're leaking is um, you're interested in a website that affiliates you with an illegal political group, for example. Um, it might be better just to say, you know what, this, you know, failure is the better option. And that's different than in a lot of cases when we talk about sort of like the interference and extension mechanism. Right. If, if it's just this right. is an optimization to make. Right. And, yeah, and, right. I, and, and I'm wondering if those are like, we think of these all the same way because they, 
they manifest themselves in the wire in very much the same way. But I'm wondering if like semantically they're just fundamentally different and we should, you know, split this into two bugs. Yeah, I mean, I, I can imagine other. I'm wondering if those properties are just kind of based on the layer that we're talking about that like, okay, transport ossifying is different from security ossifying. And if you have your, you know, HTTP semantics ossifying, or like if, if your extension is failing to work there, then you aren't able to do this particular application function and your website's not going to work in this right way. And it's going to look like garbage. Um, Chris, yeah, Chris was, was, was pointing in that, a direction in the chat too, right? Like, so the application specificity versus transport specificity, right? Like, so the farther away you get from the infrastructure, the closer you get to semantics that end users care about and the more careful you need to be. Right. Things either get more you know, dangerous for their security privacy or right. they get more impactful of their actual um, application experience. I got to think about that a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Colin. Hey, um, so just following on from that, are there properties other than security or, or privacy where we would want to fail if we can't negotiate the extension rather than continue non-extended? Yeah, I mean, that, that seems to be the, the key distinction Brian's pulling out. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it sound, I, I would guess that, you know, at some of the application level functions, if the entire point of a given connection or bit of communication was to to use this particular extension mechanism that allowed me to do you know let's say you know we're adding um you know we have ways of doing within h3 we can do unreliable stuff because we're doing some gaming extension i, I don't know um i guess we could always design fallbacks that try to use other things yeah, at some point, get far so, enough that the application relies on newer semantics yeah it, it, to some extent it depends whether it, whether it's that it works better if you have this extension versus uh, it doesn't work if you don't have the extension the problem with sni is that it does work right i mean you get your connectivity the information goes from point a to point b and then it also goes from point to point c which is is you know what you're trying to prevent with the with the whole point of the extension. I, I, I was trying to think about whether there are other situations other than sort of security and privacy where where failure is the better option. And the only one I could think about was the was the one that Tommy I think was thinking about but didn't say, which is where you're building an application whose job it is to test the extension. You obviously want the the extension test application to fail when the extension fails. But I am resistant to this idea only because I um, am very aware of our uh, sort of tribal history of um, saying security is special, especially in the transport area. And I really want to resist saying that, but it might just be that security is special. Yeah. Well, and I'm, I'm wondering also, like, there, there is a there is a temporal aspect to all of this in that my my set of things that i'm willing to downgrade gracefully like every graceful downgrade because the extension doesn't work has to have explicit engineering work from someone designing what is the downgrade to and i have to do potentially a lot more work to simulate what i was going to do um or, or compensate for it i'm only going to do that back to a version that i believe works very well on the internet and I think it's stable and I don't, and maybe it itself was an extension point that was created just enough years ago that it's stable and I believe it works. Um, like, you know, at, at some point, you know, we're not, no one's going to be going back to SSL V whatever, and we're already not going back to TLS 1.0 and 1.1. Um, so if certain things don't work, there's only so far we fall back. Um, and that's, I don't, I don't know if that's often um, kind of documented or made explicit that, um, you know, when we have these extension mechanisms, it's almost like we want to say like these ones 
you know, work everywhere. You don't have to fall back beyond these. For that. Okay, we have people in queue. Martin? Martin? Yeah, so Watson made a comment in chat that I, I thought was interesting. I, I think it's a, it's a security point that he's making, but it made me think that um, about one of the principles in the draft that I wrote, which is um, if you can't trust the other side to implement a particular feature properly, sometimes it's not worth continuing. So um, if, if it's clear that they have not correctly implemented header parsing in HTTP, I'm not going to send them requests with headers in them because that probably won't work. So I'm going to close the connection down. Um, and part of the reason you do that, um, to, to Watson's point, is so that you know when something has failed and you escalate mm -hmm. rather than, than just sort of try to muddle by and, and follow along with the, uh, I guess, the robustness principle. I will, I will attempt, to, attempt to interpret intent and yep. try my best. Um, doesn't always get you reliable res results. So that's, that's, a, that's a reason why you might not want to, want to do that. Yeah, Carsten says fail fast. I, I think fail noisily was what I was really looking for, but yeah. Yeah. Fail fast and let everyone know that it's bad. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Brian. All right. Um, so I think this is useful stuff. Any other points people want to make here? Any other examples that people want to bring up? Um, that would be enlightening for us. All right. Um, without that, I think we can move on. And yeah, we'll, we'll look at the notes from this and um, discuss on the list about what we want to do with um, this document and maybe what are the things that we could um, add or tweak in it, and we'll ask people to kind of review it more holistically as well. Okay, so the other part I wanted to discuss today on the deployability side um, was kind of, you know, what are the mechanisms that we have within working groups to track our interop or deployment if we're doing experiments and new extensions how do we know and coordinate that we're doing these and this is something that had been discussed a fair bit on the working group chairs list and that was a nice big thread so i imagine you know, people have opinions there um so here um you know i know we have Examples with quick and with t within TLS and um, other areas about you know how are we doing stuff on GitHub or different groups use wikis and stuff. But I'd like to hear um, from this group kind of what are the models that they've done for tracking implementations and interrupts and deployments and what of those work well. What are the things that would be useful for your groups? going forward. Wearing something on your head. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Charles? Uh, yeah, so I guess my thoughts on this were, and I want to see if it should be treated as part of the same thing or not, but in terms of deployability, just uh, aiding or increasing deployability. So it may not necessarily be code that is implementing the protocol, but code that help someone with implementing the protocol, like just a library or a test client, or mm -hmm. a lot of the types of things that we end up working on in the, in the IETF hackathons, for example. And those things may be long-lived, they may be short-lived, but they kind of help move the protocol forward. They can help someone gain an understanding of the protocol, may help someone with implementing the protocol or adding support for it into their, their, their client, their server, whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. I think those things are not straightforward for people to find in general. Of course, people working in the hackathon can find them. Uh, but, you know, if they're hopefully there's links to them on the wiki, but, but we don't have a consistent way of tying them back 
to the uh, the work that the working group's doing, or even the uh, making it. If you have the RFC, like how are you ever going to realize there's this code associated with it? So yeah. that, that was my interest, and it's. I think it helps deployability and deployment. It doesn't measure deployment. It, yeah, that's yeah, yeah. In context here, or should that be a separate issue? No, I. I um, I mean, we, yeah, we can probably open up another issue here for that, um, but it's definitely on the topic um, that we are looking at, because ultimately, like, I, I think I'm only interested in tracking deployments and interops to the extent that it helps improve the deployability. Um, so within the hackathon work, because I think that's you know, one of the best concrete sources of implementation work that we have. and. You know, that's where, of course, some of this interop testing goes on. Um, how have you, what are the different ways that you've seen people act, actually link to that? Like, where are they putting this? Like, is it within like ITF wiki, other wikis, GitHub, Google Docs? Like, where is this stuff going today? Well, it's usually in the, uh, the hackathon wiki, the hackathon for that, the, the wiki for that specific hackathon. Like, we had one for ITF 108, we'll have one for ITF 109. If you go back and look at those, you'll find links to, uh, you know, directly to say GitHub repos. Uh, sometimes they're a link to another wiki, and then that wiki has uh, the links to the, the GitHub repo or you know, wherever the code may be. So you can usually find the code that people were working on for all the projects. But the other place you find it is in the, the presentations that they did, which are also uploaded uh, to uh, actually not in this case, not to the wiki, but to another GitHub repo so that we have. So if you know where to look, uh, you can probably find this for basically almost all the projects. Uh, but what happens after the hackathon? Are, are those links still useful? Um, uh, do people know to go back and look for them? It's, uh, yeah, because it's in multiple different places and done in different ways, we don't have like a set recommendation for how to do it. I'd say in some cases, people will add, they'll put the code in the um, in a GitHub repo that is perhaps even on the, the wiki page, for, sorry, in the data tracker for the working group. And that's arguably a good way to go, but that's not done uh, universally either. And so, you know, as an additional URL, you can get to from the data tracker. Yeah. But perhaps that's a good thing to do. So my thought was, just to get people to discuss this and agree on, you know, perhaps a small set of ways that we think these are the recommended or best ways to do it, and then yep. try to get those to be used consistently. Yep. Um, Colin. Uh, yeah, I'm just thinking back to when we did this for the RTP uh, spec when we went from, uh, uh, I guess, from RSC eighteen eighty nine to thirty five fifty. Um, and I mean, I, I guess things have changed quite a lot in the uh, far too many years since then. Um, but uh, we we had a, an, an internet draft uh, where, where we pulled out all of the uh, the essential interrupt points and uh, went through and listed. Um, you know, actually wrote down a list of uh, implementations for each one and uh, whether we'd found uh, interworking implement implementations or not. Um, and uh, I mean, that that was never intended to be published, but. Uh, Going back, uh, I, I can see uh, if I look in the proceedings from about IETF 50 or thereabouts, uh, the, the draft and the slides where this was discussed in the working group are all still there. So uh, we, we, we at least have a, a record of how the, the interrupt discussion worked. Um, so so uh, I'm not sure it's desperately useful now, but the, there is a, perhaps a case for uh, uh, ha having, uh, having the interrupt records in a, in a way which lives within the IETF process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, thank you, Martin. You were commenting in the chat. Do you want to? Should we just say this out loud? Um. So, so um, one of the things that I've observed about this is that the protocols that seem to to work the best are the ones that have a community develop around them. And so you have a group of people who are all working on implementations and working on the specs, and they communicate with each other. And I haven't found that in those communities there's been any problem with awareness of what people have, where they're up to, uh, any of those sorts of things. Um, there's a couple of things um, like 
what Roman pointed out in the chat in terms of reporting about the, the status of implementation when you're working on something new. Uh, um, that's just so kind of naturally falls out of all of this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I mean, yes, of, of course. Yeah, the, the healthy communities are doing the work. Yeah, but I, I think for the discoverability point, like I look at what Quick does with, you know, there's the main Quip, Quick web page for the protocol, and it has links to everything there. Um, that is, you know, a far better place to go to if you want to understand what's going on on the protocol development than to go to data tracker or anything that, that's actually, you know, in the IETF page, um, which I, I, I'm not sure that we should kind of have the barrier to entry such that if you want to have that level of um, clarity and communication that you need to go figure out how to, to do that. Or if we, we should have a, a template for that or a way to make that easier to bootstrap. Um, I don't know. Uh, Rowan? Yeah, I, I guess I was for what, what, what you just said, which is it's not clear to me that we need the interop reports and the implementation reports to be all in the same format, but I think what might be nice from the discoverability perspective if the data tracker had a standardized way to point to the unstandardized report. So you could go to a working group and it could point to whatever we think we want it to point to, which doesn't have to be standardized, but there's a repeatable and a consistent way to find whatever is written up. Yeah. Uh, me? Um, I only want to very slightly disagree with Martin. So um, where we have um, developer communities that works well and people know uh, where to find things and can talk to each other, but there are also always people who are not part of this community who want to join the community who develop a new mm. um, implementation. And especially in for Quick, for example, this is this phase where like a lot of people work at the same time in implementations. But if somebody wants to join later, they should still be able to, to benefit from all the work that have been done there. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think part of this is overall, and there's there's a background desire to you know make sure that we don't have too many silos of communities, that we don't have our IETF protocol documentation being completely separate from people who are actually doing open source implementations or have, you know, different groups that are not talking to each other. So yes, for the cases in which it already is working and we have implementer communities that are very involved in ITF and they have their own place to do their work, that's great. But how do people enter that group if they don't know about it? Um, and how do we make it clear that If, if a working group wants to invite implementers who are not otherwise involved in um, documenting protocols to be involved in the protocol, how do they do that? Colin? Yeah, I mean, all this discussion about pointing to external resources, I mean, I think that that would be great if we could provide an easy way of doing that. But but of course, those resources are, are not necessarily stable and uh, not necessarily easy to find in the long term. Um, one of the things which we make very difficult for groups is to add uh, resources on the ITF site. You know, yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I mean, I, I guess we have a wiki, but uh, it's pretty clunky and it's uh, it's not very easy to find. There's no easy way of say saying, you know, upload a bunch of Markdown files and they get rendered nicely and it all appears in the site and the chairs and the working group members can easily just keep it up to date. And it's somewhere very visible along with all the, the information about the group. And I sort of wonder if if we made it easier to put content on the ITF site, then, then maybe groups would and, and uh, you know, it might be easier to find some of this interop information, yeah. information yeah. about the way the protocol is being used. And you're referring to like data tracker as a site for that. I mean, whether it's whether it's on the data tracker or or some other sites. I mean, I'm not sure it really matters, but somewhere on itf.org where stuff can easily get up 
linked from the pages on the, the data tracker and, and you know, wherever we mention the working groups. Yeah. And Martin's commenting in chat that the TLS wiki rotted pretty fast. Um, yeah. One, like one, one thing I was thinking about for data tracker is like the model that we've had more recently for like how people can propose slides or things like that is a lot better also than cases where it just relies on chairs to go and upload and update content. So I think we would also want, you know, anyone, if we were hosting information or links to implementation status, being able to have those implementers be able to propose content into there would be useful. Brian? Sorry, looking for the mute button. Um, so another thing that uh, I've seen in Quick, I haven't seen in other, other working groups, I expect that they that it exists in a, in a, a few other places though, is um, actually publicly available endpoints. So implementers will keep a publicly available endpoint for testing up. Yep. And uh, this makes sense in sort of the, the quick world where everything is happening very quickly. And, you know, they already had, a, yeah, sorry. And they already had a um, sort of a cadence of virtual interops uh, yep. even before we all got off of airplanes. Um, and you have the time zone problem. So obviously you want to keep, you want to keep the, the, the endpoints up. Um, I suspect that a lot of people in implementation communities of more um, uh, mature protocols probably also have testing endpoints up for you know for their own use and having a, a way to collect yeah. or make those um, make those more publicly available uh, because there you don't have the problem of a wiki that rots. I mean, you might have a problem of you know the, your publicly available testing endpoint is, you know, seven revs behind the thing that you're actually shipping. But if you're actually using it for online testing anyway, then hopefully the fact that, you know, it's the code would would keep it from rotting as much. Yeah. Yeah. I think that would that'd be very useful to have pointers too. Yeah. Um, also, you kind of mentioned the virtual interop schedule and how that you know ha happens on a cadence. Right. That's something that you know, also seems like it would fit well. Like we have meeting schedules visible on data track and other things. If we had kind of more support for saying like, yeah, these are our interrupt times or our calendars for doing other things. Maybe that's useful. Yep. All right. Other thoughts that people have, um, maybe any, oh, Robin? Uh, Tommy, can you hear me? Yes. Hello? Yes. OK. So uh, in fact, uh, the, in our world, this is the routing area. So you know that so the, for our SRV6, we have a draft to record the implementation status and also the interoperability status. I think that's a possible way. But uh, uh, we know that so you some sometimes when the uh, when the RFC is published or the working group is closed, uh, maybe not uh, there's uh, not a, a way to update this draft or the RFC. So I wonder if we can simulate the IPR mechanism because we know we can disclose the IPR for the draft or the RFC. So I think maybe we can take some tools uh, to for the possible users to disclose their the implementation or the interoperability test result regarding some draft. So I think they may can update this information at any time. Mm -hmm. No, that, that makes sense. And that's one of the things that was discussed uh, okay. on the list. Um, so essentially, I, I think there are a couple different parts to what you said, right? So like. One, like within routing, there's already a practice of documenting in a draft, like here's the implementations section. So we can talk about that, but we can also say maybe does that belong 
in or I can either mirror that or move that to a section on data tracker with in the document that says, you know, here's the implementation status for it and have ways of filling that in in a stable way. And then that lives beyond the um, kind of development of the document and then you can kind of keep updating that even after the RFC is published. Mm -hmm. And then you're saying even kind of decorate um, like tools would let you get back to it or whatever other view of the RFC, right? Yeah. Because now there's the implemented status. Some of this, the implemented status always from the co-authors. But you know that the co-authors are limited. So yeah. after they yes. finish the draft of the RFC, maybe later they will not update this uh, section. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Makes mm -hmm. sense. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah. So, what what are people's thoughts and reactions to that? Um, I know there are a lot of different opinions on if we should how how we should formalize that documentation. Uh, Watson? Yeah, so I think I'm not sure what the question is about tracking interop and deployment. If it's these are the servers that are running these draft versions that you can test your implementation and figure out where the draft is clear during the operation, that's different from curating a list of, of implementations later. And so I think some of the concerns people are raising about the stability and how do you find it, et cetera. Or you know, it's a short-term thing. It doesn't need to last beyond the publication, the draft necessarily. If if it's only for the development of the draft. Yep. And then something that's more like the long-term, like this OS implemented this feature is not something that you need a stable endpoint for. You just want to say like this thing implements this or this version. Yeah. So I think with and I only really know NTP. Reasonably well, what's going to happen is there's going to be new versions released with NTS, and they'll prominently have that in their release notes. Mm -hmm. And people will look there and see what the package does and see what the what the features are. Whereas a lot of the implementations we're making are not full featured; they're just there to show the protocol works and hammer out bugs in the spec. Right. And I imagine different groups would find. A different value in actually documenting or, or capturing either the development stage of implementations or the kind of deployment stage of it. Um, but having the tools there maybe would be good. Um, Miriam? Um, yeah, I think the, the, the thing that we need to concentrate first on is how to find this information rather than trying to standardize this information in a certain way. Um, if we if we can make it more easier to find, then maybe a kind of pseudo standard or whatever arises because people get used to seeing it in a certain way. But as long as people don't know that this information exists, uh, it's everybody just comes up with their own mechanism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and kind of matches what Martin was saying in chat, um, Charles. I think to uh, to that point, one of the things I wanted to try was at least for the next hackathon, let's just try this and let's see for all the projects if we can get uh, links back, you know, that, that make it easy for you to tell, uh, you know, what working group that project's related to and, and how mm -hmm. to get access to the code. So whether you are on the hackathon wiki or you're in the data tracker, you know, you're, you're able to find out from the data tracker that there's this code that may be useful to you if you're yeah. in the, uh, to get that linkage. And then in terms of what the status is, what that code's about, whether it's something applicable to you, to me, that's what the readme is for. And, uh, you know, uh, we're not that I don't think uh, all readme's are updated as they should be over time, especially as code, uh, you know, gets sort of abandoned or degrades or whatever. 
but, but, but to me, that would be the place to say like, hey, we're not actively using our main database anymore. Um, you know, and then, so even if someone did find an old link, at least uh, hopefully the readme would set them straight as to whether or not this is code they're really interested in. Yeah, that, that, that's an interesting um, point in general about using, kind of using the fact that we already have the hackathon infrastructure and that going on as the concrete way to try try some of these tools out. Um, and in some ways, I imagine like you know, if we design something that works well for integrating data tracker documents into what's going on in the hackathon, um, when groups want to do virtual interrupt testing, that's essentially just like individual hackathons that is they're essentially running and we could have it look the same. That's a good idea. All right, anything else from people? We have a couple more minutes, but we can also wrap up. All right. Cool, so thank you all for joining. Um, yeah, this is very helpful and we will continue discussing stuff on the list and GitHub. I think some of the actions that we have coming out of this are one to um, take a look at our, what we've discussed here for kind of the extension mechanisms and review on the list, uh, Martin's document and see what we want to add or send to that and how we can adopt that and progress that. That's one. And then on the other side, I think we, we do have a concrete thing in which we, we can look at um, maybe how can we integrate some tools with what's going on in the hackathon coming up and use that as a way to um, kind of experiment with um, having more formal documentation for our interop and deployments. So thank you all. And we'll try to get the uh, recording posted somewhere sometime, and we'll let the list know that. All right. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Tommy. Thanks. Okay. Bye. Bye.